All right, so, um, heck, it doesn't want to stay there. Um, so uh, I'm John Johansson. I work on the canonical security team, and I'm also the uh, kernel maintainer for the App Armor module. Um, so this last year, uh, the App Armor project moved hosting to GitLab, um, which has helped with a, uh, we, we used to be on Launchpad, um, which GitLab's really helped uh, pick up and uh, integrate with some of the other projects to get other people involved. Uh, we picked up a new logo this last year as well. Um, great fun. <laughs> Well, you gotta see Scary Penguin, right? Toxie. Um, uh, we also picked up the CII Best Practices badge. Um, this is a little plug for them. So uh, it's a good thing for projects. If you've got a project to try to pick this up, it's not that hard to do. It's mostly a lot of uh, crossing your I's, dotting your T's, crossing your T's, dotting your I's, basically. Uh, you need to get your HTTPS and version control and stuff so, and document what you're doing there. Uh, doing GitLab or GitHub or something like that's really gonna get you most of the way there. And then it's you know, making sure you have security policies, what to do with your project and stuff like that. And it's just a checklist that you run down. Um, and then you know, it, it, it let, lets other people know that you're doing things right and it also helps you make sure that you're doing it right. So, uh, what's App Armor besides a security module? We've heard it several times before. Uh, a lot of people know something about it anyways. Uh, often you hear uh, path name based. Uh, App Armor is actually a, a modified DTE, um, not just files. Uh, files is one of the properties. It's the, the primary one right now that we're using for files. Uh, but in the labeling, if you know anything about DTE, uh, would be implied from the files uh, or the typing. Uh, but you can have exceptions to that where you're using a, a label on the disk or something. So you saw Matthew talking about them using the security app armor uh, X adder. Um, so they're running a little bit ahead of us on our support on that right now. Uh, but the very little bases in there that they're using. Um, it's very much still a work in progress. We are not done with our model or getting to where we need to be. Uh, and yes, as some people have said before, DTE is the kitchen sink. Yeah, it is. Uh, semantics, yeah, whatever, right? It's, it, the goal is to really make it work uh, for people, make it easy. Um, the other thing being here is, this goes back to the original paper that Crispin presented in 2000 at um, Usenix, there is actually some capability system in here, so uh, though most of that hasn't actually landed yet, there's just a little piece of that that's in there right now. Um, the important takeaway from this is that, you know, yes, we're a Mac, uh, policy DTE domain type enforcement, it's from the domain's point of view, or largely, um, and there's some dynamic components to it. Um, there are some design goals around App Armor. Uh, it starts with a targeted policy. That's so that, that that's where we started from. Instead of say SE Linux starting from the strict policy and saying what can we just do to, to improve security on the system, uh, we want to make it easy to confine applications. Uh, we want more than just confining applications. So it's not just applications, despite its name. Um, it's controlled sharing an awful lot, and you can build sandboxes and stuff on top of it. Uh, users are really the biggest problem in security. <laughs> we have real problems, and we, you know, when, we, when you're starting out, you have real problems, and with administrators or users just saying, yeah, get, get security out of the way, and we want to avoid that as much as possible. We want to make it easy to selectively enable or disable things, and easy for a user to understand what's going on. Um, uh, so with starting with targeted policy, that doesn't mean we got everything in place, and we still don't. Uh, the goal being, you know, we want to work towards it. Uh, one of the things we do to get out of the way is we have an unconfined mode. It's similar to SE Linux unconfined T. 
Uh, it's used all over the place, it's special cases. And so what do we uh, look like? So the base unit of uh, an app armor mediation policy, whatever, is a profile. Profile is just this text blob. Uh, it's got a little bit of language. It's very similar to what a user would expect to see. Uh, it was originally some of the syntax comes a lot from, you know, 20 years ago, you're talking C programs and stuff, so you're seeing include and stuff like that as part of the syntax. Um, if, uh, there's different rule types. They're very natural to, each one's supposed to be towards uh, the, the class that it is. So files, you're looking at a path name, uh, read, write permissions, stuff like that. Dbus, uh, example here, it has its own set of, you know, idiom or whatever you want to call it of how do you express what's going to happen with it. Um, so the top bit there, that's uh, what we'd call the preamble. That's just a way of sharing some stuff and setting some things up. Uh, the profile name, uh, this is the domain label, sort of, um, sometimes. Uh, and it's, it was what shows up in PS minus Z. Uh, Domain label also, you could think of that as subject type. Um, this is an attachment. Uh, there's different attachment specifications. So this one's a path-based one. Matthew earlier talked about uh, adding the X adder one for EVM. Uh, there are some other ones coming as well. There's just some flags to modify profiles. This is uh, the complain flag is basically equivalent to audit to allow, except for you can do it on individual profiles in the system instead of applying it to the whole system. Uh, then you get a rule block. Uh, the include section, that, that's just another way of saying these are just regular rules in here. It's just they're abstracted out so you can uh, share them, right? Um, and then you have some, uh, we've got some rules here like for a uh, file, for dbus, the syntax is declarative, so order doesn't matter. Uh, like I said, we've got different classes or rules. This is all whitelisting, so the allow is actually optional. You almost never see allow in the syntax, uh, actual policy files. Um, you do see denied sometimes. Denied's not necessary, but it's nice to annotate certain things that you know you want, to, that you, it's gonna be denied. Uh, and then there's some rules that each profile gets to control domain transitions that are happening. Uh, if we go back here, the, uh, the attachment, that is used by unconfined. So like we said, we get out of the way as much as we can. Unconfined needs some way to know whether it's gonna attach to, to applications that you, it runs um, and put them into an, a confined context. Uh, these domain rules here, uh, the profile can choose to use the attachment, but it can choose to do something else. So this one's saying, I'm gonna allow running uh, Firefox to run base name, but it's gonna inherit my confinement. It's, it doesn't, it's, we're not transitioning. Um, and then policy is just composed of a whole bunch of different, you know, profile files. Um, Profile files, uh, text files aren't useful uh, for actual enforcement of the kernel. So what we do is we take and we compile those down and we build a state machine. Um, it's kind of a bit like going to BPF. Uh, the state machine has guarantees about completion and control of memory usage and it's verifiable. We have some other um, requirements. Uh, so it's not, it's not BPFS, BPF, it's, it's more restricted. Uh, it has certain properties that we need to uh, do some policy composition. So it follows um, some rules around set and regular language properties. Uh, it's also architectural independent. Uh, as much as we can make it anyways, it is right now. There are some things that may land eventually that would break that sometimes. Um, so the basic overview of how it works, I mean, it's not very different from other security modules. Uh, your text pile policy goes into a compiler, that loads it into the kernel, so you have some active policy. Unconfined uh, does, you know, look at the active policy at times, like I said, using the attachment conditionals, uh, but it's mostly getting out of the way. It's special cased all over the place. 
and a confined application, it has a context that references into the, the policy and it's enforcing it. Uh, the kernel's doing a whole bunch of work. Uh, and we put labels and we carry some context information on objects. Um, and then we, we also have a user space, trusted helpers, or uh, you could call them other things as well, that selectively enforce bits of policy. So things like we saw the dbus rule early, earlier. So uh, if your dbus is enabled to support, it will actually look at app armor policy and uh, look at communication coming across the dbus and enforce that part of the policy for us. Uh, we have XACE, pro XACE prototypes that have never gone anywhere because XACE is so much fun. Uh, um, and th there's a few other places where that's been used. Um, the trusted helpers are uh, um, limited. You can actually confine them themselves, and so they're just applying to the, their little corner of what they're doing. And of course, we're auditing uh, messages to the audit subsystem and letting it deal with the rest of it. Um, so that's the basic overview of the AppArmor system. That's where most people would see it. Um, AppArmor has policy namespaces. So uh, we've been front running this a little bit compared to some of the other LSMs. Uh, this comes into a lot of how we want to do things and do things in AppArmor and how policy is set up. Uh, so uh, they're, they're separate from uh, system namespaces. Um, so policy namespaces, they, you know, they let you run load policy of different, uh, you know, same names, uh, different policy sets, right? Um, they, they, they show up as a, in the domain name, kind of like, you know, we've got an NS, uh, kind of SSH style, or we've got more the uh, URL style. It'll do either the kernel shortens, use the shorter form. Um, they're hierarchical. Um, each one's obviously getting its own set of profiles. Uh, they also get their own unconfined state. So tasks, we track which one they're in by the unconfined state. If you're in unconfined, you could be in uh, NS5's unconfined. Uh, they also define a view of policy, so what's visible. Um, tasks at the system level could look down if, if they have the privilege and they could see the other namespace policies so they could see NS3 or NS5. And they also control what can be loaded. So if you got a task that's being confined by policy or as cap Mac admin whatever at the system level, it, it's gonna be able to load policy into the system namespace. But if you have a task at uh, say confined in NS3 it, it's only seeing what's in uh, the na NS3 and now namespace, and it, um, it can't, it, you can only load policy to NS3. You're not gonna be able to load system policy. Um, and similar, we, we, we could do that for another one down. Uh, uh, right now, it's a, a complete separation on the, the view and the, the, the policy load. Uh, it's not very useful for a lot of situations when you're looking at like this. Um, there is a use case we'll cover that where it's kind of being used. So if you just had namespaces for it themselves, you know, it's, it's an either or situation and we had this for quite a long time. And for us, that isn't um, a very useful situation. So you'd be either in the system namespace or you'd be in the, say, NS5 and the confinement, the, didn't communicate pr properly, shall we say. Um, so to make this useful and to, to work towards our policy where we want things to be, we have, um, and this is getting also into the capability stuff a little bit. Uh, so we have policy stacking that can happen at runtime. Um, theoretically, though we're not doing it right now, some of this can actually be done at compile time. Uh, and so the cost of doing these stacks that we're gonna talk about can be mitigated a lot. It just depends on what you're trying to do. Um, uh, stacking is specifically an intersection of permissions, so it's a way to reduce privilege um, or ensure privileges uh, within certain bounds of two intersected policies. So let's say we have a, a task in the system namespace 
uh, I, I'm, I don't care what it's doing. It's, it's just confined by it. Um, and then, you know, it can do whatever, right? Uh, let's put a, a task in the system namespace and namespace three. So what, what's happening here is the task is being confined by both namespaces and the policy of both are gonna get applied. Um, so uh, this, this is a way of allowing you to set up policy for one thing, uh, some, some basic restrictions that you would want, and then having something else set up some other policy, right? Uh, where, can, where is this useful? Well, containers, right? Uh, so what we have is we can set up some course policy at the uh, system level, some things we, we can say that we don't want the container to do, be able to do to the system, some mount rules or something like, uh, so we can restrict what it's mounting inside the container and be sure about that. Um, and then the container itself can load policy, have its own policy. So LXD right now on Ubuntu, will you can use uh, an Ubuntu container that has its own policy while the system um, has its own separate policy and is enforcing things on the uh, container. There is some horrible hacks in here to make this work at the moment due to interactions with system namespaces that have not been resolved. Um, we are working on proper solutions to that, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, and theoretically, we could do three-level deep nesting or more, um, but again, this is currently uh, restricted and broken because of the horrible hacks in system namespaces. Um, So the, oh, I said, you know, before we said that the namespaces define a view, a scope. The scope is just, the view is what you can see, the scope is where it applies, and the administration. So right now, all of those are tied. Um, we have some work coming to uh, split that out. And so a namespace could inherit its parent's view um, and, or its parent's scope. And this is this just uh, as a way to make them more flexible. Um, and bring in the other use, some of the other use cases we actually have. So the first use case we enabled was containers, where you wanted the kind of isolation. Uh, where we want to actually go with these beyond that is uh, a much more complicated, rich policy. So your system can have a policy. You could define some global stuff. You could set up a policy for some users to have different roles. And you can also then, with uh, the scope and view work enable users to define their own policy. So maybe instead of having, so right now often you'll have like the system define a Firefox profile, which is kind of crazy because the user's running it. Um, the user could define his own how he wants to confine his application that he's running. And the application itself can actually define sandboxes with it and, and load policy and use it. This isn't enabled yet. Uh, it's still a work in progress. Um, and all of those get combined together and enforced. Um, stacking doesn't need to be across namespaces, um, and this plays back into delegation. Um, so the delegation of authority, of the capabilities that we uh, I just mentioned briefly before. Um, so when delegation lands, um, there's going to be policy rules around it, but there's also going to be an API that allows user space to load policy. Um, now, we don't trust user space. Uh, yeah, the user space is going to have to compile the policy and it's going to get loaded. It's going to be a state machine that we can verify, but we still don't trust user space because they can stick anything in there, right? So you could have something that's confined, uh, got a profile on it with some a set of rules, and the user space is trying to abuse it and delegate its authority. Um, but it doesn't have authority to delegate the rules that it, it's trying to throw. So in this case, let's allow you to read or write every file in the system. So we can use stacking to dynamically limit that. And then what happens is the intersection of those two, the actual policy that the system, uh, that application has, and the delegation set is actually what you're going to be able to delegate. Um, now, this obviously has a runtime cost because you're doing some extra computation. Uh, for now, we're just going to 
be uh, allowing this to be handled dynamically. It doesn't actually have to just be handled dynamically, though. Uh, we don't want to stick the compiler portion of building these state machines into the kernel, but we can certainly, you know, uh, do an up call in that user space, compile this in, from a trusted point of view, a trusted comp compiler back end, and bring that back in, and, and that new trusted one can uh, be passed back in and replace the dynamic one. So temporarily, you're in a dynamic situation that has a higher cost, and then once you get user space giving you a trusted, uh, verified intersection, then you can apply that instead. Um, and so back to the domain label. So you start seeing weird things like this that, you know, maybe I have some intersection that doesn't make any sense at all, but it doesn't matter. You know, we have, we have a profile Firefox and we have a profile events. Normally I said those could be the domain label. When we start talking stacking, you, you get them together and that's at the actual domain, domain label or, or type. Um, so that's you know the basics of app armor policy. Uh, so what what have we been doing recently? Um, we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes and a bit of upstreaming, or maybe a lot. Ubuntu used to carry a large delta for app armor, and um, we fi finally landed everything upstream except for the AF Unix patches. Those are seeing some review and some work around. Uh, are on support for improving network. So um, our network mediation is a work in progress. So we've landed uh, support for SEC IDs finally upstream. Um, and this is in preparation for supporting network mediation. It's also allowed us to land support for audit rule filtering. So we certainly um, log to audit, but now audit can, you can do audit rules based on the AppArmor task label or the domain label. Um, we landed socket med mediation. Uh, so this is the coarse grain control of sockets for things that, you know, you're not doing a, you know, fine grain IPv4, you know, I want this address or anything like this, but, you know, well, no, I don't want to allow uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe I don't want to allow IPv6, or I don't want to allow AF packet sockets, that kind of level. Um, it, it, it's better than nothing, but it's not what we're, where we're going to be. We're, we're working on uh, the fine grain stuff right now. Um, profile attachments, uh, you saw the start of integration that Matthew's done with uh, the, the EVM, IMA. Uh, there are some other conditionals that are coming. Um, there's improvements on overla overlapping execs that, that happened as part of this. So those attachment conditionals, there's possibilities for overlaps and there's, there's ways to check and figure out what's working. And uh, originally we had a much coarser check that was a heuristic saying, we know this is good, we don't have to do extra work. Now we're doing extra work to make sure, you know, we can get those areas that were somewhat sketchy on the heuristic um, and get the best match. Uh, we have uh, some work on the no new privs improvements. So uh, our no new privs, there is stuff that has landed here. So no new privs is uh, a, something that came around with SecComp. And when it first landed, it, it, was, uh, it blocked LSMs from being able to do transitions. We have some stuff in AppArmor now that allows us to do subset transitions and track that. So like in the stacking situation, say for containers, uh, maybe no new privs is applied when you're setting up your container. So at the system level, your system container policy is not changing, but within that container, uh, it can actually transition the policies underneath in the, the, the lower part of the stack. Um, there is some other work for an override of no new privs as well, but that has not landed yet. Um, we had a problem where policy didn't carry ABI info. Um, you, we did have a way to specify ABI, and we, basically it was either or. So either you didn't specify the ABI at the system level, and it basically said, use what the kernel's ABI is, or um, you, you could specify, hey, 
I'm going to pin my policy to this ABI. Right. Um, so for development, using the kernel ABI is great for policy. Uh, it's not so great for distros, but guess how many distros actually configured it that way? So if you were changing your kernel frequently or being a kernel developer, you could break people. Um, and we did have some problems with that. So uh, we landed uh, an ABI, we're landing an ABI feature here so that you can just specify an ABI in policy and that's what's gonna get used. The old stuff still works that doesn't have the ABI specified, it's just uh, pinned to earlier ABIs. Uh, it can't use new features. Um, the cache was still a problem as well when we, we start talking about kernel. And so we used to have a single cache. Uh, so like I said, we build policy, we make a state machine. So if you switched your kernel, then we had to recompile and uh, that was problematic for kernel development as well. So now we've gone to a per kernel cache that can be pre-compiled. Um, it handles collisions, so like here, if there's, there's some hashing involved on the, the ABI, and if there's a, a collision, you just, you get a little subscript on it, and it's checked. Um, we also, at the same time as we were doing this work, we added uh, overlay support for policy and cache, so that you could ship a, a read-only image and still have local changes if you wanted to allow that. Uh, we landed pretty much everything there. I mean, I, I did say that there's the no new proof stuff that didn't quite land, um, but we also have, well, part of the no new proofs. Um, and didn't have as much land as we wanted. Uh, there's a whole bunch of work that's in progress right now. Uh, there's some internal improvements and cleanups that are happening. Uh, we're reworking the early policy load uh, to better integrate with systemd and ha have it happen uh, natively. Uh, and even a uh, little bit of support for doing it in the NIT RAM MS. Uh, you can do that now, but there's no skeleton at all for that. You have to go do it all manually yourself. Um, we're not really advocating doing that, but we do have some people who would like that support. Uh, the fine grain network mediation is still a work in progress. Uh, uh, you know, there needs to be a whole bunch of improvements on the mount mediation. We have some mount mediation. It's pretty rudimentary at the moment. Um, there's some actual work on key rings and ioctals going on right now. Uh, there's a whole bunch of improvements coming on the audit side of things. So we, right now our audit structures are on the stack. And we're going to pull those off the stack, uh, do some caching of them. Uh, there's also, uh, so we can do some elimination and speed things up there. Uh, uh, our complain learning mode features, so how we do policy development, are seeing some improvements as well. So if anybody's followed the SecComp notify work that Tyco is doing, we've been borrowing from that, and we're going to actually have some interactive ability there for po profile development that uh, will actually make things a lot nicer. Um, there's some further, further attachment conditional work coming on. Uh, uh, improvements to the uh, conditionals and permissions within the structures, uh, more policy namespace work. Uh, delegation is a continual work in progress. Uh, it's something we really need to land. Uh, improvements to PAM app armor, system namespace integration, and documentation at the perennial thorn in our side. <laughs> uh, so any questions? Questions? Anyone? Well, thank you. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker.